Indeed, all praise is due to Allah. We praise Him, seek His assistance, and ask His forgiveness. We seek refuge with Allah from the evils of our own souls and from the evil consequences of our actions. If Allah guides someone, none can lead that person astray, and if Allah leaves someone to stray, none can guide him. I testify that none has the right to be worshipped except Allah alone without any partner, and I testify that Muhammad is Allah's worshipping servant and messenger. People of Iman observe taqwa of Allah as he rightfully deserves, and do not die except submitting to Allah and Islam. Mankind observe taqwa of your Lord who created you from a single person, and from him created his spouse, and then spread from the two of them multitudes of men and women. Observe taqwa of Allah by whom you make requests of one another, and do not sever ties of kinship. Indeed, Allah is always watchful over you. People of Iman, observe taqwa of Allah and speak words that are correct. If you do so, Allah will guide you to perform righteous deeds, and He will forgive your sins. When a person obeys Allah and His Messenger, he will achieve the greatest success. Dear Muslims, Hajj at Allah's sanctified house is one of the defining marks of Islam and one of its most prominent rites of worship. Hajj is a magnificent institution of learning from which Muslims draw valuable lessons and admonitions and from which they emerge with refined conduct and ethics. The passages about Hajj in the Qur'an abound with remarkable lessons and it would be quite fitting for us to contemplate those lessons and understand the objectives behind them. Allah said, Remember and inform the people about when we designated for Ibrahim the site of the Kaaba, saying, Do not direct any form of worship to anyone besides me, and purify my house for those who perform tawaf, stand, bow, or prostrate themselves. This passage implicitly rebukes the mushrikun who worshipped others besides Allah at the very location which was founded from its inception upon Tawheed, worshipping Allah alone and none besides Him. This passage also contains the command to purify the sanctified house for those who come to it in obedience to Allah and in fulfillment of the rites that He prescribed. This encompasses purifying it from tangible impurities as well as intangible ones, such as shirk, directing worship to others besides Allah, and sins in general. Furthermore, Allah ascribing the Kaaba to Himself by referring to it as My house shows its nobility and virtue. Elsewhere in the Qur'an, Allah said Hajj is in the well-known months. Those months were clarified in the Sunnah. As for the pillars of Hajj, such as being present at Arafah, Tawaf al and Sa'i, those are mentioned in the Qur'an in separate passages in a way that is general. However, details of the manner and order in which they are to be performed was clarified in the Sunnah by the Prophet, may Allah Graham commendation of protection. He explained them in words, demonstrated them through actions, and emphasized the importance of learning and retaining what he said and did during the Hajj he performed. He said, learn your rights of Hajj from me. This is a clear refutation of those who detest his Sunnah and deny its authority as a primary source of Islam. Such people call for abandoning the hadith of the Prophet and claiming that they suffice with what is mentioned in the Qur'an. This deviant faction is referred to as the Qur'aniyun, though their views are actually in complete opposition to the religion of Islam. As for Allah's statement, when someone reveres all that Allah has made sacred, that is best for him with his Lord, it indicates that if someone avoids sins and all things which Allah has prohibited and senses within himself the gravity of perpetrating such wrongdoing, that person will be rewarded immensely for being that way. Just as performing acts of obedience with the aim of drawing nearer to Allah merits rewards, avoiding what he prohibited in order to draw nearer to him also merits rewards. Furthermore, Allah said regarding the animals which people sacrifice to seek nearness to Him, it is neither their flesh nor their blood that reaches Allah, rather it is your observance of taqwa that reaches Him. This means that what reaches Allah and merits His reward, even though He is completely self-sufficient and does not need any of His creation, is people's observance of taqwa, their bearing in mind that Allah always sees them, their reverential fear of Him, their adherence to His directives, and their sincere devotion of all worship to Him alone. This passage also encourages having sincerity when offering a sacrifice and doing so with the intention of seeking Allah's face, not to boast, be seen or heard of by others, 
or as a mere customary practice. This applies to all other acts of worship as well. If they are not carried out sincerely for Allah and while observing taqwa of Him, they would be like form without substance and like a body without a soul. Allah then said, Thus He has subjected them to you. Here, Allah reminds us of His favor in subjecting the sacrificial animals to us and allowing us to use them in various ways, although those animals have bodies that are although those animals have bodies that are larger and stronger than ours. This lets us know that the way things run in this world is not necessarily in line with what people may think should be the case based on what is apparent. Rather, they run in accordance with the will and decree of the Almighty who is able to do all things. As for Allah's statement, you are to complete Hajj and Umrah for Allah, it indicates that the greatest aspect of completing one's Hajj and Umrah is performing them sincerely for Allah alone. This is understood from the phrase for Allah, which con which conveys exclusivity. Hence, it is prohibited to set out for Hajj or Umrah intending to be seen or heard of by others. Rather, a person must devote those sincerely to Allah alone. In emulation of the Prophet, may Allah grant him commendation and protection, who said, O oh Allah, let this be a Hajj without wanting to be seen or heard of by others. In the passages of the Qur'an about Hajj, Allah said, You must offer a sacrifice that is within your means. This indicates that the teachings of Islam aim to make things easy for people, easy for those performing Hajj or Umrah. Islam's teachings emphasize seeking out whatever would be easy for a person and within his ability. In fact, ease is a quality that is inherent to the teachings of Islam in general. Allah said, He did not place any hardship upon you by way of the religion He prescribed for you. As for the statement of Allah regarding expiation, one must offer a fidya of either fasting three days, feeding six poor people as charity, or offering a sacrifice, it shows that expiation protects a person from incurring sins and being punished for them. This idea comes from referring to expiation with the Arabic word fidya, which can be understood as meaning ransom. The passage under discussion also indicates that honoring the sanctity of ihram by not committing acts that are prohibited while in that state, holds high standing with Allah. This is understood from referring to the expiation for violating that sanctity as a fidya, ransom. And ransom is not offered except on behalf of something that is very precious and significant. Later on in the same passage, Allah used the Arabic word nusuk in reference to offering a sacrifice. The word nusuk means worship and seeking to draw nearer to Allah. It is similar to Allah's statement, Say, I sincerely devote my prayers, my nusuk, right of sacrifice, my life and my death all to Allah alone, the Lord of all creation. Allah then said, If you are in safety, then whoever performs umrah in the months of hajj before performing the rites of hajj itself must offer a sacrifice within his means. If unable to do so, he must fast three days during the months of hajj and seven days after returning home. Those are ten days in all. This passage contains a valuable point to take note of. After Allah said he must fast three days during the months of Hajj and seven days after returning home, Allah followed that by saying, those are ten days in all. This was done to preclude the possibility of presuming that one has a choice between fasting either three or seven days. This alerts scholars and those who issue edicts to the importance of clarifying Islam's teachings to people in the most lucid and complete way possible and to remove from people's minds any erroneous ideas or beliefs they may have. Later in the same passage, Allah said, you must continue to observe taqwa of Allah and you must know that Allah is severe in punishment. This indicates that knowledge is the strongest factor which drives a person to remain fearful of Allah's punishment. This is understood from the phrase, and you must know. Hence, the more knowledge a person has, the greater his reverential fear of Allah becomes. This is supported by the statement of Allah the Most Exalted. The only people who have true reverential fear of Allah are those who have knowledge. Servants of Allah, in the statement of Allah and argumentation must be avoided during Hajj. The type of argumentation prohibited is the type which takes place among some people due to disputes that arise between them. It is the type which evokes anger, leads to exchanging insults, leads to exchanging insults, and is at odds with the sanctity of Hajj. However, there is nothing wrong with presenting arguments in order to clarify the truth and teach people who may be ignorant of certain things. In fact, this is considered a commendable righteous deed. 
Allah said, and present arguments to them in the best manner. Additionally, Allah's statement, intercourses, precursors, sins, and argumentation must be avoided during Hajj, indicates that the person performing Hajj must preserve the sanctity of his Hajj and protect it from anything which may annul or detract from it. He must do so hoping to attain the reward promised by Allah's Messenger, may Allah grant him commendation and protection, in his statement, if someone performs Hajj at this house, while refraining from intercourse and his precursors, as well as from sins, he will return as sinless as he was on the day his mother gave birth to him. After what preceded, Allah said, and whatever good you do, Allah most certainly knows it. This indicates that drawing near to Allah by avoiding sins remains incomplete if not coupled with performing righteous deeds. Allah then said, you must take provision for yourselves, and the best provision is most certainly taqwa. This refutes those who claim that taking provisions is at odds with placing complete trust in Allah. Just as Allah instructed people to place trust in Him, He also instructed them to pursue necessary means, and taking provision is part of pursuing the means which have been prescribed by Islam's teachings. This passage also shows that taqwa is one of the most important provisions which a Muslim needs to prepare for the hereafter. This can be understood from the fact that taqwa was likened to provision which a person cannot do without. Such a profound similitude is sure to provide encouragement and strengthen one's resolve to prepare that provision of taqwa. Next comes Allah's statement, There is no harm in you seeking bounty from your Lord by making lawful earnings during Hajj. It contains encouragement to seek provision and expend necessary effort to acquire it. The passage under discussion also contains a subtle point of benefit, which is attaching one's heart to Allah even pertaining to mundane matters such as trade and making a living. This can be understood from the phrase, Seeking bounty from your Lord. And all bounty lies in the hand of Allah, the Most Exalted. The mention of Allah's Lordship in this passage alludes to the fact that all people are in absolute need of their Creator, whereas their Creator does not need them in any way at all. Next, Allah said, Make mention of Allah as He rightfully deserves, since He is the one who granted you guidance, and prior to that, you had indeed been among those who were astray. This indicates that the worst form of misguidance is straying from the correct religion prescribed by Allah. And this meaning is understood from some of the Arabic words in the passage cited, which convey emphasis. Next comes the statement of Allah, Then depart from the place where all the people depart. This indicates that one of the magnificent objectives of Hajj is establishing equality between Muslims and instilling humility within their souls. This can be gleaned from the fact that Allah commanded them all to be present at the same place, to depart from it altogether, and to not let any of them be distinct from others in terms of the place where they are, the place where they are to be present, or the place where they are to depart from. The tribe of Quraysh and those who followed their religion used to spend the daytime on the ninth of Dhul-Hijjah and Muzdalifah, whereas the rest of the Arab tribes used to spend in Arafah. Hence, Allah commanded His Prophet, may Allah grant him commendation and protection, to head to Arafat, spend the day there, and then depart from it. I say this much, and I beseech Allah to forgive myself and all of you. Thus seek Allah's pardon and forgiveness, as He is the continually forgiving, the bestower of mercy. All praise is due to Allah who designated Hajj at this sanctified house as a means of rectification and steadfastness for the remainder of a person's life. I testify that none has the right to be worshipped except Allah alone without any partner. He is the supreme sovereign who knows all things. I further testify that our Prophet Muhammad is Allah's worshipping servant and messenger. He is the best individual to have ever prayed, fasted, performed Hajj, and remained steadfastly consistent in obeying his Lord. O Allah, grant your commendation and protection to your messenger as well as to the messenger's esteemed family and companions. Continuing our discussion of the passages in the Qur'an pertaining to Hajj, we come to the statement of Allah and seek forgiveness from Allah. Allah is surely most forgiving, bestower of mercy. This establishes that it is prescribed to seek Allah's forgiveness at the conclusion of acts of worship in order to make up for any shortcomings which may have taken place while performing them and in order to repel any conceit which may arise within one's soul. Next, Allah said, Once you have completed your rites of worship, you are to make mention of Allah as you mention your forefathers or with much greater mention. This is an encouragement to make constant mention of Allah. 
the human soul may be inclined to complacency or laziness after concluding acts of worship. And this is why Allah gave the directive to constantly engage in mention of him after concluding the rites of Hajj. A person who has Iman is one who constantly mentions Allah. Servants of Allah, establishing the mention of Allah is the motto of Hajj and its greatest objective. When a person performing Hajj constantly mentions Allah, he would savor the sweetness of holding private counsel with his Lord and he would find solace in mentioning his Lord and Creator, the Almighty and Most Magnificent. That way, he would emerge from the learning institution of Hajj with a tongue that is moist with mention of Allah and a soul that is attached to it such that Allah always remains present in his mind and words. Hence, any heedlessness would be counteracted, any pause or stoppage in mentioning Allah would be eliminated, and the person would become one of those who mention Allah often throughout life. Near the conclusion of the ayat pertaining to Hajj in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah said, This applies to those who observe taqwa. This shows that the wisdom behind prescribing the rights of Hajj is to attain taqwa of Allah. If a person observes taqwa of Allah during Hajj such that he fulfills Allah's commands and avoids Allah's prohibitions, Allah would forgive that person and wipe away his sins. This very same taqwa which Hajj inculcates within the person performing Hajj is the same taqwa which he must observe throughout his life when it comes to Allah's commands and prohibitions. Just as Hajj requires a person to avoid sins and disputing, it also trains a person and refines his conduct such that he adopts that avoidance as his constant practice. Hence, servants of Allah, we must beware of returning to despicable actions or traits after having fulfilled Allah's commands, devoted ourselves to Him, and sought to draw near to Him by performing various acts of worship. Rather, we must constantly perform righteous deeds, embody noble traits, remain steadfast upon the correct path, and adhere to the directives prescribed by our Lord. It is truly commendable when one righteous deed is followed by another righteous deed, and it is truly reprehensible when a righteous deed is followed by a misdeed. If a person repeated the talbiyah during Hajj in response to the call of Allah and strove to perform righteous deeds during times of special virtue when people seek to draw us closer to Allah and attain His forgiveness, that person must also answer Allah's call to obey Him in all times and places. This is because the meaning of the talbiyah is I answer your call time and again and I obey you time and time again. If a person avoided the things that are impermissible during the state of Ihram while performing Hajj at Allah's house, that person must realize that there are things which are impermissible at all times and he must beware of perpetrating them or coming anywhere near them. Allah said, The aforementioned are limits which have been set by Allah so do not come near them. Furthermore, just as a person is keen on taking protective measures which protect him from ailments and epidemics, he must also be keen to give Allah due reverence by ensuring that he fulfills what Allah has obligated, avoids overstepping the limits Allah set, and stays away from all that Allah made impermissible. He must give that more concern and attention than he does to the things which set his worldly life in order. No one truly reveres Allah's directives or the rites of worship which He prescribed except those who observe taqwa of Him, have correct knowledge about Him, and give Him due reverence. Therefore, it is incumbent upon all of us to abide by the directives of Allah, give due attention to what Allah forbade us from neglecting, and not treat lightly any of the limits which Allah set. We must adhere to the religion that Allah prescribed for us, sincerely ask our Lord to keep us steadfast, and earnestly beseech Allah to not subject us to trials or allow our hearts to deviate. Servants of Allah, bear in mind the instruction that Allah gave us when He said, Indeed, Allah grants His commendation to the Prophet and the angels invoke Allah to grant Him even further commendation. People of Iman invoke Allah to grant the Prophet commendation and to grant Him protection as well. O oh Allah, grant your protection to Muhammad and the family of Muhammad, just as you granted commendation and protection to Ibrahim and his family. O oh Allah, be pleased with our Prophet's successors, Abu Bakr, Omar, Uthman, and Ali, as well as all of his companions. O oh Allah, grant your guidance to our leader and direct him to all that pleases you. O oh Allah, we implore you to grant strength to Islam and those who submit to you in Islam. 
O oh Allah, we implore you to grant your assistance and support to those who defend our borders. O oh Allah, we beseech you to accept the Hajj being performed by all who have come. O oh Allah, reward them and grant them their forgiveness. O oh Allah, accept the repentance of all the people of Islam who return to you. O oh Allah, guide the people of Islam to adhere to the religions you've prescribed. O oh Allah, Grant relief to those who are afflicted. O oh Allah, we call upon you to remove the pandemic we face. Allah is perfect in every way. He grants protection to all of his messengers, and all praise is due to Allah, the Lord of all creation.